All right, let's do this. We are in nitrogen metabolism, and we're going to be talking about making serine, cysteine, and glycine. And the way that we're going to talk about this um, is by looking at the ways that uh, some single carbon transfers. So the past couple videos, we've looked at reducing nitrogen, and we've looked at moving the amino group around, and now we're going to move some carbon groups around. All right, so this video you should be able to draw the pathways to serine, cysteine, and glycine, identify the coenzymes that can transfer single carbon units, match the coenzymes with the pathways, and describe the connection between vitamin B12 and THF, which is tetrahydrofolate. This is our big picture. Again, we are going to be, finally, we're going to be up over here today, starting with glycerate 3-phosphate, uh, going to serine, and then serine can make, um, can be the starting point for both cysteine and glycine. So here's the pathway, 3-glycerate, um, 3-phosphate, three, and 3-phosphoglycerate are the same thing. Um, I usually abbreviate this as 3PG. Three PG. So this is the pathway starting with 3PG and getting to serine. So the first thing that happens is there's an oxidation reduction reaction where NAD plus is reduced and the 3PG is oxidized. And it makes this molecule that you've probably never seen before, but you might be able to tell me what kind of molecule it is because it has this functional group here, which makes it an alpha keto acid. And if we take an alpha keto acid and we add an amino acid to it, then the products we get are a new alpha keto acid, I'll just put alpha Ka, and an amino acid. And this, of course, is catalyzed by transaminase. where the source of nitrogen is coming from the GLU. And now we have our amino acid backbone. And we're getting pretty close to serine. All we need to do is get rid of that phosphate and you've got a serine. And that's exactly what happens in the next step is you pop the phosphate off and then you get to serine. So the three phosphoglycerate is providing um, essentially the carbon backbone, well, plus this little oxygen, the 3PG provides this carbon backbone, and then GLU is providing the nitrogen. So now we're gonna go from serine to glycine, and then we're gonna side story into a vitamin and some coenzymes. So there's one step, a deceptively simple step, that will take us from serine to glycine, so I'll do in black. One step, I'll move it down here, to get from serine to glycine. I'll try and draw it in the same kind of orientation. There's glycine. And In order to get from serine to glycine, you essentially got to take a carbon off and you've got to take the OH off. And the carbon is going to come off. We're going to focus on the carbon. Uh, the carbon or this methylene group. So when you have a, oh dear, what is that? What just happened? There we go. A CH2 is a methylene group. To move that CH2 off, we're going to use a coenzyme called THF. So tetrahydrofolate is going to need to come in and it's going to take that methylene group in with it and it's going to leave as a molecule called N5N10-methylene. I didn't leave myself enough space, did I? I'm going to move you over just a little bit. And 5N10 methylene. THF. Okay, 
DHF is a coenzyme, which means it's organic. It comes in as reversibly bound. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called, let me do a different color, we'll go green here, it's called serine hydroxymethyltransferase. And the OH is leaving as water. Okay, so we've just met a new coenzyme, which means we're going to meet a new vitamin. All right, tetrahydrofolate, or abbreviated as THF, also has another uh, abbreviation, which is this H sub 4 folate, also stands for tetrahydrofolate. I always use THF. I just wanted you to be aware that you could also see it as this H4 folate. A tetrahydrofolate is derived from a vitamin. So you have to eat vitamin B9, which is also called folate or folic acid. And to get to tetrahydrofolate, there's a two-step process that is catalyzed by the exact same enzyme. So you have you have this enzyme in your body. You have to eat this. So you eat the vitamin B9 or you eat the folate and then dihydrofolate reductase adds two hydrogens at a time. And these hydrogens are added on to the ring that just has nitrogens in the ring. So if you'll notice the first the first step here adds hydrogen here and here. So if you're looking at this one, you're adding the two hydrogens and the two electrons there. And then the second step that's also catalyzed by dihydrofolate reductase adds, does the exact same thing up top, adds this hydrogen, and then there's an extra hydrogen there to get to tetrahydrofolate. Now this tetrahydrofolate is a single carbon carrier. And it can carry carbons on a couple of different of uh, the nitrogens. And the nitrogens that you'll see are labeled in the diagram. Where's my eraser? I'm gonna go ahead and erase here. You'll notice that up top, the two nitrogens that are important are already labeled. So there's this nitrogen right here that is called N5. And then there's this nitrogen right here that's called N10. Those are the nitrogens that can carry carbons. Why is it not letting me erase that? Because it's too late. I don't know. Anyways, N5 and N10 are also down here. And then 10. So let's take a look at all the different kinds of single carbon carriers and we'll bring it back to glycine and then we're going to move forward. Okay, so like I said, tetrahydrofolate is a single carbon um, carrier. We already looked at getting to tetrahydrofolate from folic acid that you would eat. And we've seen that serine hydroxylmethyltransferase can take the methylene off of serine and that generates um, what I called N5, N10, methyl tetrahydrofolate. So the methylene group that has been added is between, is connecting the N5 and the N10. And this right here, if you'll remember, a methylene is a, just a CH2 group. Okay, so we would say that N5, N10, methylene, THF is one single carbon carrier. So this would be a molecule that I'd want you to recognize. And then getting to two other single carbon carriers of tetrahydrofolate, 
these two here require this intermediate, um, this intermediate that has the, the cation in it. So we're going to pop over the intermediate because it's not, it's not stable for very long. But the two, two other single carbon carriers of tetrahydrofolate are both formal. A formal is just, oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. It's just an aldehyde group. Just an aldehyde. And if the aldehyde is attached to N5, then it's called 5-formal THF or N5-formal THF. And if it's called, and if it's attached to nitrogen number 10, then it's called N10-formal THF. The only one that's not the, the fourth um, carbon carrier of THF that's not in this pathway, I had to find like a different diagram for it, is when there is a methyl group on um, N5, and that's called N5-methyl-THF. Okay, so once THF is made, there are four different ways it can carry single carbon units. And they want you to be able to recognize these molecules. You don't need to um, be able to draw them from scratch. But they do want you to be able to recognize them. And they all carry a little bit different flavor of a single carbon, but they're all just carrying one carbon at a time. Um, and these carbons are in different oxidation states. Okay, so in order to get the glycine, you need um, THF and what comes out is N5N10-methylene THF. Okay, so now we're going to go from serine to cysteine, our, our last final uh, amino acid, and technically also requires the movement of a single carbon, although it's not perfectly obvious right away. So let's start with the really big picture, just reminding ourselves what cysteine looks like. So it's, and it's not just a single step here. It's, it's a few steps with some branch points on it, but let's draw cysteine. I'll try and kind of keep it in the same way as the serine. Let's do highlighter, I guess. So everything carbon-wise is the same as serine. So you can trace the carbons all the way back to 3PG. The nitrogen here came from the serine nitrogen, which ultimately came from GLU or glutamate. And what that leaves left over is this SH. And the SH, the source of the SH is, oh, is that what I thought? I'm back in highlighter mode. Click, click. Let's go back to black. Okay. It's coming from methionine. A reminder about methionine structure. Okay, so methionine is going to be the source of the sulfur, and as maybe you're starting to see, in order to get to the sulfur, we got to take a methyl group off. So we got to do a single carbon transfer, even just to get to expose the sulfur, to move the sulfur over. Um, and this is going to require a, a new, this is going to require a new carbon transfer molecule that we abbreviate as SAM. And then in order to regenerate methionine, we're going to use some, we're going to reuse um, THF again. All right, so this looks crazy. It looks a little bit too much, but let's talk about uh, let's let's talk about how we're getting here. So serine is right here. So that's kind of where we've been starting um, and trying to end with cysteine. So just as an orientation, 
and methionine is up here. So let's talk through this. I don't want you to memorize how to draw all of these molecules, but it was important in order to be able to track the atoms, like who's going where, um, and how do we get that? How, where's that methyl group going, and, and where's the sulfur going? It was important to be able to see the structures of things. So remember the sulfur from cysteine, we track it all the way back to the sulfur of methionine. And the rest of um, cysteine is coming from serine, okay? And then I guess what I'll label in blue here is going to leave uh, and become propanyl-CoA, but it's the rest of this is ultimately uh, methionine. Okay, all right, so let's follow the sulfur, because in order to get to the sulfur, we've got to move the carbon, and that's what we're trying, that's kind of one of the big pictures of today, is how do we move carbons around? So in order to move the carbon, the methyl group, off of methionine, we need to create a molecule called S-adenosyl methionine, and this is SAM, S-adenosyl methionine, and then in S adenosyl methionine, you have this methyl group attached to a sulfur with a positive charge. Super, super, super reactive. And once this has been created, you can use a number of different molecules to pop the methyl group off and create and move the methyl group around. So making S adenosyl methionine or SAM, once we make SAM, which in order to make SAM, you need ATP and methionine. Oops, let me just cross that through. Once you've made SAM, you've got this reactive alkylating group where you can now move that methyl group onto other molecules that need it. And once that's been removed and goes, let's just, it's just going to go to other molecules. And then you've returned back to, then you've got the methyl group off of methionine and you can create homocysteine. I'm gonna use my highlighter. You've got the methyl group has now been removed, and then you can create homocysteine, and um, homo means it's similar to, but it is not cysteine. Homocysteine has two, two methylene groups instead of just one. The side chains from homocysteine and serine um, kind of link together to create cystathione, and then cystathione will lead to cysteine uh, by releasing an NH3 group and releasing these carbons down here to alpha-ketobutyrate, and alpha-ketobutyrate carbons can be recycled and made into propanyl-CoA, and maybe you might remember propanyl-CoA from odd-chain fatty acid synthesis. Propanyl-CoA will go to succinyl-CoA, which can then go into the TCA cycle to be recycled. Okay, what do I want you to remember from this? The sulfur from cysteine comes from methionine. In order to access the sulfur of methionine, you've got to pop the methyl group off. And in order to pop the methyl group off, SAM is created because SAM is a really good single carbon uh, methyl group transfer. In fact, it's better at transferring methyl groups than THF because of that positive charge on the sulfur but you create SAM to get the methyl group off and then you can move through the rest of the pathway. Now, here comes the super fun part. Going back from homocysteine to methionine requires the movement of the methyl group back. And in order to get the methyl group Put back on methionine, we're going to use a molecule called N5 methyl THF. And that will pop out THF. Okay. 
So the methyl group on N5-methyl-THF moves back onto methionine, and this enzyme is called methionine synthase. We'll just do um, met synthase. And this enzyme requires vitamin B12. So we're going to talk about vitamin B12, and then we're going to move on. Vitamin B12 is also known as cobalamin. Oh, there's no E at the end of that. Excuse me. Cobalamin. There we go. Cobalamin is a really cool structure that has some similar properties to a heme or some similar structural features to a heme, except for in the middle, there's a cobalt instead of an iron. And attached at what I would call underneath of it um, is a nucleotide. So maybe you can see there's the nitrogenous base, there's the sugar, here's the phosphate. And the cobalt is surrounded by a porphyrin ring. See, it's got all the nitrogens on it um, and all the interconnected bonds there, the five-membered rings, around and around and around. What makes, so this is, this is vitamin B12 or cobalamin. What makes us different from a heme group is that there's this open spot, I'll call it at the top, on the top of cobalamin, or the cobalt, that can accept, um, that can, oh sorry, that can accept, yeah, that it can, so blah, 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 that can accept any of these three, or any of these four, functional groups at the bottom here. I'm primarily only concerned with the methyl group. And on the right side of the drawing is the 3D. And I thought the 3D image, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I could see it a little bit better in the 3D image. Um, right now the cobalt, which is in the middle, is attached to a C triple bond N, but that group could be an OH, a methyl group, or a nucleoside. So how to best look at this. How does this work? Methionine synthase requires vitamin B12. And I think once I draw this out, you're gonna be like, oh, I've seen something very similar to this. Okay, so methionine synthase, which is an enzyme, requires vitamin B12. So it requires this big giant molecule in it in order to move the methyl groups. So 5-methyl-THF, N5-methyl-THF, is going to essentially give the cobalt the methyl group. So let's turn this into a methyl. And, th and that's gonna pop back out as THF. And then homocysteine is gonna be like, oh hey, I can take that methyl, I'll take that methyl from you. And it's gonna pop out as methionine. Ping pong kinetics, anyone? Mm, yes, so methionine synthase does follow ping pong kinetics, where instead of a PLP passing the molecule or passing the functional group around, it's the cobalamin or the vitamin B12 that passes, um, that is the acceptor for the methyl group and the donor for the methyl group so that you can regenerate methionine. You regenerate methionine, um, you can make SAM again, and you can make SAM, and you can make homocysteine again, and from homocysteine you can make regular cysteine. All of these things are connected. In particular, I wanna talk about the connection between uh, folate and vitamin B12 as it relates to a particular disorder 
called pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia. Okay. So pernicious anemia is essentially a vitamin B12 deficiency that leads to anemia or I'll just decreased red blood cells, mature red blood cells. And it also causes neurological, can cause neurological damage. And the tricky part about this is because of the connection between um, vitamin B12 and folate, a deficiency in early stage, uh, early stages of vitamin B12 deficiency can look like a folate deficiency, which would lead you to treat the wrong disorder. Because, well, let's talk about it. So if you are deficient in vitamin B12, and again, it's a vitamin, which means you have to eat it, or for humans, uh, the major source, uh, let's see, who makes vitamin B12 who, on the planet? Uh, bacteria make vitamin B12, and some archaea do. Now, a lot of these bacteria live in the, are in your gut microbiome, and the gut microbiome between the human and the bacteria makes a little bit of vitamin B12, but typically not enough. So you need to eat some more vitamin B12 to make sure you're not vitamin B12 deficient. And the major source for humans of vitamin B12 is meat. Um, that's why oftentimes people that are vegetarian or vegan get told to take a vitamin B12 supplement because plants don't make vitamin B12 and they're probably not getting enough vitamin B12. Um, so the other cause of the vitamin B12, so either you're not eating enough vitamin B12, that's one part, um, or with oftentimes with pernicious anemia, your body, the human body, is unable to absorb and use the vitamin B12. So either you're not eating enough of it or your body's not able to absorb it. But other, in, in all, you have a vitamin B12 deficiency. Okay, if you have a vitamin B12 deficiency, it means that you don't have enough vitamin B12 for your methionine synthase to put a methyl group on it. So if I back, doo -doo -doo -doo, where's the methyl group coming from? Doo -doo -doo -doo. That means uh, I've got methyl THF is... Uh, we're just like increasing, increasing this amount in the body, a ton of methyl THF. And this reaction right here is irreversible. And the body wants to get here, which you're not getting enough methionine being made because you don't have vitamin, you don't have enough vitamin B12 to move the methyl group. And so the body thinks <laughs> that something, something like they know something's going wrong with the methyl transfer part. And so it starts to upregulate this pathway of moving more uh, carbons to THF to make methylene THF. And then you're getting even more um, regular methyl THF being made because the step from methylene to methyl THF is irreversible, so your concentration of methylene THF is going down, and your methyl THF is going up, 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 up. Now, how might this be connected to, fol are seen as a folate deficiency? Well, you need folate in order to make THF, and if you can't get all the way to methionine, then it can look like um, you have a folic acid deficiency, which are linked to certain types of anemia. Okay, and where's the anemia coming from? Well, the anemia is actually coming from this decreased amount of methylene THF. Methylene THF is needed to make an important component of DNA called thymine. Thymine is the, the nitrogenous base. It has the methyl group on it. Thymine is needed in the DNA in order to make red blood cells, or in order to help red blood cells mature. Okay, so if you're 
low on methionine, meth methionine THF, that means you're not making enough thymine, which means you're not making enough DNA, which means you're not getting mature red blood cells. That's the anemia part. Okay, so if you have a vitamin B12 deficiency, early stages of it look like a folate deficiency because folate deficiencies lead to anemias. However, if you treat this with folate, so if you give someone with a vitamin B12 de deficiency because it looks like a folate deficiency, if you treat them with folate, like you're just saying, well, just take some vitamin B9, you're going to make this worse. You're going to make it a lot worse because this folate is going to go to THF, which is going to go to methylene THF, which is just going to keep producing more and more and more and more and more and more and more methyl THF. And then the neurological symptoms are going to kick in. And here's where the neurological symptoms come in. Where's my highlighter? Let's go... Which color should I use? I'm loving that pink, but let's go green. We don't have enough to make... We don't have enough vitamin B12 to make methionine. So we're not making that. But we are having, which means we're going to have a lot of homocysteine. And that's going to divert into the pathway to make cysteine. Because it's accumulating. The byproduct of this pathway to make cysteine was that um, alpha, or that uh, beta ketobutyrate. I'll just go to beta keto B, which makes the propanyl CoA. I'm gonna move this up and then I'll actually just gonna, yeah, slide. Which makes propionyl Okay. Propanyl CoA, like I said before, is the breakdown prod is a side product of odd chain fatty acids. in order to be able to sort of recycle the propanyl CoA and use it in the body to make ATP, it needs to be made into succinyl CoA. Well, guess what you need to go from propanyl to succinyl CoA? You need vitamin B12. Dang it! I need vitamin B12 for that? Uh-oh, I don't have enough vitamin B12 for that. I don't have enough vitamin B12 for that, so I'm not making enough succinyl CoA. So I'm also, I've got a whole bunch of extra bonus propanyl CoA. You know what happens in your body when you got too much propanyl CoA? Not good things. It will accumulate in the membranes of neurons. Not a good thing. There's where the neurological damage comes in. Okay. So, if someone appears to have anemia, <laughs> you're going to want to tease out whether they have a vitamin B12 deficiency or a B9 deficiency. Because if you don't tease it out and you're like, oh, you're just anemic, you need to eat some more um, folate, you need to move some more vitamin B B12, you could make this whole pathway, the whole pernicious anemia worse for that person and lead to the neurological damage where the propanyl CoA starts accumulating on the neurons and that is not reversible. You can't undo that neurological damage. It is permanent. Anyways, I thought that was really interesting. A little bit horrifying, but kind of interesting. A little side note about our vitamins. All right, a reminder of our methyl group carriers. We first saw tetrahydrofolate it can carry methyl groups on N10 and N5. And it has four different forms of doing this, whether it's holding a methyl group, a methylene group, or a formal group. And it can put that formal group on either N5 or N10. Those are It's still holding on to single carbons at a time, and there's four little forms of that. The second 
one that we saw, the second um, single carbon carrier that we saw was SAM, S-adenosyl methionine. And SAM is really awesome at moving methyl groups, and it's better at moving methyl groups than the methyl THF because of that positive charge on the S. This is called SAM. So SAM also can move a single carbon at a time. And then we saw vitamin B12, which in the body is called cobalamin. And cobalamin can move more than just single carbons at a time, but it is also a single carbon carrier. It can move a methyl group, and it is kind of an intermediate um, intermediary between things. So it's not a single carbon carrier all on its own, but it can pass carbon groups between. And I wanted to just remind you, I don't know, you probably didn't notice, but pretty much all the carbons that we looked at have hydrogens on them. But you have seen the carbon carrier, the single carbon carrier that moves fully oxidized carbons. What color should I do? Where have I done? Uh, da -da -da, I guess I'll do, let's do blue. Let's go blue. And that is biotin. We've seen biotin before. Biotin is a prosthetic group for um, pyruvate carboxylase. And also acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And the biotin attaches covalently to the enzyme, and it's always attaching through a lysine group, but the biotin is the single carbon carrier for the most oxidized flavor of carbon, and that is a CO2 group. So biotin moves the CO2 groups. Just wanted to kind of remind you, we've seen a single carbon carrier before. Um, so today we talked about single carbon carriers for reduced flavors of carbon or more reduced flavors of carbon, but we've already seen the single carbon carrier for the oxidized flavor of carbons, the CO2, um, and the pyruvate carboxylase and acetyl-CoA carboxylase flavors. Biotin is vitamin B7, in case you wanted a reminder of that. All right, those are our single carbon carriers. Okay, so big picture here. I'm just gonna zoom in. Glycerate 3-phosphate can also be abbreviated as 3-PG, and that's a carbon skeleton for serine, cysteine, and glycine. To get from serine to glycine, we do need a THF, and that will pop the methylene group off of serine to get us N5, N10, methylene, THF, this will also spit out a water molecule, just for funsies. Uh, vitamin B9 is required to make THF, and that's a sequential reaction by dihydrofolate reductase, um, and that requires two NAD pH molecules to get all the way to the reduced form of tetrahydrofolate. To get from serine to cysteine requires methionine. And I'm just going to kind of connect this in here. And there's an intermediary called SAM. And SAM is made before homocysteine is made. And homocysteine and serine combine to make an intermediate, and then that is made into um, regular cysteine. SAM will transfer its methyl group somewhere else. And then in order to regenerate methionine, you need N5-THF, which will, take, which will give us THF back out, and vitamin B12 to get back to methionine to go around and around and around and around and around. And if I really wanted to, I could connect these and say, oh, this tetrahydrofolate could be recycled 
and use down here in order to make glycine. Pretty cool, huh? All right. Uh, we're probably going to talk about some more diseases and cool stuff. Um, we're definitely also going to talk about... In class, we're going to talk more about the dihydrofolate reductase because it is a really important target for chemotherapies in cancer. So get ready. I'm excited. I'll see you in class.